Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ, the series where I answer all your knife questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This is episode number 110. And before we get started, Thomas, can I borrow a buck? No. All right, if you're unfamiliar with this series, first of all, welcome. And the way this works is we take questions from our comments section below these videos, pick out some good ones and feature them uh, and attempt to answer them well uh, in future episodes, this being one of those. Uh, so if you want one of your own questions to get featured, if you want a chance at that, drop it in the comments section below. Uh, this week, it is episode number 110 and yeah, had to make that uh, that terrible joke there at the beginning. So I, I apologize. I'm only sorry a little bit for it. <laughs> um, but first up this week, we actually have some questions from our friend Andrew from Kershaw. Uh, he was here uh, a couple weeks ago filming the new 2023 lineup with us. We got to feature that uh, earlier this week. And he had some kind of surprise questions for me. Since I did that to him a couple years ago, he came up with some uh, prepared and, and surprised me with them. So such a devious guy, a devious, devious. He's, he's a nice guy. Though. I like yeah. him. He's good. Um, so we're going to cut back to a couple of weeks ago when we filmed this. And uh, hopefully I, I answered those questions. Well, so well, last time I was here, you asked me some questions about being a knife designer. And so I, I wanted to kind of flip that on you and ask you some questions about being a like knife reviewer slash like YouTube presence. Oh boy. Okay. So uh, all right. From your time in in the industry doing your thing, what's been one of the like coolest, most like jaw dropping moments that you've had? Interesting. Well, honestly, some of it has to do with you know just having having done this for a few years now, being able to go to shows and have people recognize me is is pretty weird. It's pretty yeah. surreal. Um, the you know Blade Show this last year, especially there were a lot of folks that that just wanted to say hi, and that was. That is so appreciated. Thomas and I, but Thomas gets grumpy on with most things. Most things. And he was grumpy because we were trying to, you know, we we're usually trying to get some places, but I love, like, I love hearing from folks. Yeah. Um, but probably s jumping off of that, probably the most cool thing now is, is the people. Yeah. Um, is the people, even before I started here at Knife Center, I mean, I used to write for a blog before this. Yeah. And I've got friendships with people like, like, bigger name people in the industry that I'll just call up and say, Hey, are we doing breakfast before the show today? And, yeah. and being able to do that, it's, if, if, I, if I look at it, like from the outside, it's like, Oh, these are these people. And that's, that's really cool. Um, that's, it's gotta come down to the people. Um, similar thought, like the, the thing I've said before is like the first year I ever went to blade show, it was, Ooh, look at all these shiny things. And the second year I went to blade show was mm -hmm. like, Ooh, look at all my friends. That's really cool. Um, and it, it becomes that because this whole niche, this thing is a, is a family, you know, not to, not to exclude the, uh, the ladies out there, but like the term brotherhood gets thrown around a lot because yeah. it's like, these are my people and I found them finally. Yeah. And that's pretty darn cool. Yeah. That's so that, that's my answer. I fi love that. Final answer. Sticking with it. That's great. What <laughs> is one of the most challenging experiences that you have had on this journey that you've been on? Challenging. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Coming up with an answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not it. Because there's, I mean, there, there's always, I mean, everything, at the end of the day, this still is a job. So there, yeah. there's the things that go along with that. Um, I don't know. So it, maybe it's balancing a little bit the, you know, the knife center side of things with me doing the, the, you know, the, the quote unquote reviews all the time. Yeah. But also my, uh, like my own personal designs that yeah. again, predate the knife center and, and, have taken a bit of a back burner now that I'm here, but you know, finding the time to still devote to like my Nordsmith project, which some of you folks out there may know what that is, uh, is is probably the thing I struggle with the most regularly. Yeah. Um, because I'm I'm looking and talking about knives all day, and then you go home and you know the wife doesn't want to hear about the knives yeah. <laughs> at that yeah. point. So you know, fi finding that just finding the time for all of my enthusiasm on the subject is still hard. That might, I don't know if that's a cop out answer or not, that's but yeah. that's, that's what's coming to mind right now. Anyway. Cool. Um, what if, if I was starting a YouTube channel, review, mm. like reviewing knives, 
what is like a piece of advice that you would give? I'm not. For, <laughs> but uh, for those, I'm sure there's people out there that watch these that are interested in that. What would you tell them to do? I'm gonna I'm gonna go back even further to when I first started. You know, when, when I first started writing about knives on the internet, it was don't do it because you want free stuff. Yeah. Um, I know people have asked me before, like, how do I get you know manufacturers to send me stuff? It's like that's not what it should be about. Yeah. Um, because eventually, you know, people are going to smell that, and your mm -hmm. your opinion is not going to be taken, you know, as as seriously. Sure. Do it because you you love it and you think you have something to say, and you know, it's if if people out there see what you have to say and respond to it, they'll reward you with views and clicks and all of that. Sure. Uh, if they don't, they don't, and you know, that's kind of what it is, yeah, I guess. Fine. But but do it because you love it, and do it because. Yeah, it's, it's kind of do it for the right reasons. And from a more kind of uh, nuts and bolts side of it is, you know, no, no manufacturer is just gonna send you stuff out of the blue, right? Mm. Start with your own stuff, go after it and, and do it. Do it because you love it and do it. Yeah, that's solid. <laughs> if, if, I, if I had prepared this, it might've been more eloquent, but that's, that's kind of the gist of it, I think, right there. I think that's great. Yeah. And then when you when you if you do build up an audience, then you can use that to show to people like the folks at Kershaw mm -hmm. or, or somewhere mm -hmm. else that, hey, I'm interested in in this particular thing. You know, you you guys are going to want to see that they have some kind of reach, some yeah. kind of audience. And if you can build that from your passion and from what you're able to bring to the table, and then show that things are just going to start to kind of bubble up. That, that that's been my experience when. Doing the writing stuff, especially like once mm -hmm. I moved over here to Knife Center, it's all, you know, there's a paycheck involved, so it's yeah. a slight, it's a slightly different a thing. Different. Yeah. But you know, have, having done the writing side of things from an organic standpoint, not from a you yeah. know a, a paid gig type right. of thing, uh, even though I did wind up earning some freelance money later on down the line, mm -hmm. I, I do have a bit of that. I, like I've been there for you folks out there that are that are looking to start something like this too. So, cool. Yeah. That sounds great. That's, All right. that's what I have. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Thank you. Awesome. Let the record show you indeed answered the questions. The record duly shows that I did answer the questions. It's up to you whether you think I answered them well or not. All right. Next question for today we have from someone named Furiously Confused. I mean, you don't have to be so mad about it. Um, hey, DCA and crew. Very important. I have been watching your videos and love knives, but my dad needs a knife, but he doesn't like knives uh, due to their relation with tactical situations. What knife should I get him? He loves good deals and would want a budget knife, nothing over $40, and it would be used in outdoor work, thanks. Cool, I always love thinking about outdoor knives as kind of one of my, my passions coming into this hobby, and the the, the reluctance to have anything remotely tactical is an interesting way to think about it because while a lot of outdoor knives don't really lean into tactical, a lot of like tactical things kind of bleed over across genres over time. To say nothing of the fact that you know a lot of the, uh, the classic knives get used in uh, movie props and as the, uh, the slasher weapon of choice, that sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, trying to think about this in a, a, a most non-tactical manner was kind of interesting because some of the, the default easy recommendations are stricken from the table right off the bat. And I left a knife out there that I need to get. But in trying to think of the, you know, this style of knife in the, the least tactical characteristic possible um, is interesting. There's a lot of good options at or under that, uh, or, or right around that $40 mark. Uh, I'm gonna show you here, there a couple here that are right up near the $50 mark too. Um, but it kind of precludes a lot of them. I mean, the Ontario Rat 1 is, is, is the right choice, but it might be a little too aggressive. Uh, the Rat folks, the Randall's Adventure Training, lean into a survival aspect combined and often use their skills and are teaching their skills to military units. So there's definitely some tactical overlap there. Um, 
that's that's honestly like the the quick and easy answer that's never wrong for this sort of situation but other stuff even uh, coming up on the $50 mark that I really like right now the SOG TELUS the Becker BK40 uh, stuff like the Gerber Gator USA made blade all really good choices might be a little too scary is not the right word but a little too uh What's, what's the right word? Tom? What, what's coming to your mind for this? Mean. A little too mean, which is different from ornery, but that's another subject. Uh, but even something like the Buck 110, the 110LT, especially, I really like for this. It's about uh, 30 bucks. Unfortunately, we didn't have one on the shelf on filming day today, but I have a 110 Slim right here. Uh, the 110LT doesn't have the thumb studs, doesn't have the pocket clip. It's a synthetic handled scale, but it's thicker like the original, so you've got good girth. Uh, but it's got a more pronounced clip, like on the Gerber Gator here, on the clip point, I should say. The buck knife, whether in folding or fixed form, is, you know, you, you see them in, in movies all the time, like the Scream movies, I think, um, all, all kinds of things. It's like the buck knife. It's iconic in a way that like that. Um, but this is episode number 110, so I had to show a buck 110 at least once in this episode. So... But mo pulling back from those, like I said, all of those would be good options, but if they're a bit too tactical for you, we pull it back just a little bit. Um, a few really good options, I think, that are going to be good for outdoorsy work and are way less than intimidating are the Case Sod Buster, for one. Uh, coming in about $38, and the Openel knives. They've got several sizes. I've got two in the number eight variety right here. For less than 20 bucks, you can get the wood-handled carbon steel versions of this, and for about 40, you can get the synthetic-handled version that has a few extra features, including a whistle for, you know, the outdoor stuff right there. And especially that outdoor version, in the blue color specifically, very non-threatening looking as far as I'm concerned. But let's go through these couple of options here real quick. The Case Sod Buster. It is a classic working man's pattern because uh, it's typically been inexpensive yet very capable. $37.99 right now. You've got a synthetic handle. You've got a basic stainless steel blade. That blade itself has a lot of belly. And while you do have a point, it's not a very stabby point. Uh, length on this is about three and three quarters of an inch long. Big enough to do some decently sized work, but not oversized, not too big so as to seem kind of intimidating. And with the handle shape there, it's not the most hand filling grip, but it is not anemic at all. There's definitely enough there to get a solid grip on it for sure. This is the working man's knife, the classic working man's slip joint pocket knife. This and like the Barlow stuff too, but even more so I think the Saab Busters are even a little more basic. Interestingly, side note, when Ethan Becker designed the BK40 folder, which this Knife Center exclusive version has D2 steel, I should mention, he was actually inspired by the Saab Buster. And it's not immediately apparent when you just look at the Becker, but holding the two side by side, you can definitely see the influence on the blade, I think at least. So there you go. That is a pretty cool thing. And uh, the Openels. The blade thickness on the Openels is thinner than on the case, I should say. So the blades might be a little more fragile. Um, and we're talking outdoor work with a folder knife, folding knife, you're not gonna be batoning or chopping with it anyway. So that, that only matters a certain amount for this scenario, but this is the number eight. It is not the biggest nor the smallest, but it is kind of the classic size. They've got larger ones that more closely mimic the size of that, uh, that sod buster right there. But even those very similar blade shapes right here, maybe a little more pokey because of the clip points on this, but you've got a very thin blade with a very shallow convex grind going on almost flat. In fact, and super, super thin, super sharp edges. And one of the most comfortable handles on any folding knife ever produced. And this has been going on for over a century at this point with, uh, with this design. Just, it worked then and it still works now. And this knife has a lock, unlike the case. You've got the rotating lock here, the Viro block. I don't know how they actually pronounce it, but it is a, uh, a rotating ring that allows you to twist 
to keep the blade from closing. And it also works to keep the blade closed as well. You can click that over and it's not gonna open up on you. Very cool. And that's actually useful if you're gonna scrape a fire steel, you can do it with the blade closed right there because the spine of this knife is crisp enough to do that. Very, very cool knives. I prefer having no partial serrations here at the heel of the blade, especially on an outdoorsy knife because if you're doing carving, I like having that space unserrated. But the outdoor versions do come with a serrated blade. You can get this, or these only come in the, uh, the Sandvik 12C27 stainless steel option, whereas you can get the stainless or the carbon on the wood handled versions. But you've got, for like I said, about 40 bucks, you've got a handle that's not gonna swell like the wood ones can. You still have that rotating lock right there. You have an even easier to open blade thanks to the cutout right here. And you've got the whistle as a nice backup feature too. So all those are pretty cool. And of course, blue always makes them something look less threatening in my mind. And also blue is very easy to see in the outdoors if you were to have dropped this along the way somewhere. Those I think would be some good options for you to check out for him. And one more to mention, talking about the, the least tactical thing out there, knife world that's gonna be useful outdoors, Swiss Army knife, man. The Victorinox Camper at about 36 bucks comes in where you want it to. And in addition to the typical implements for this size of Swiss Army knife, two knife blades, as well as the can and bottle openers. The important or the next always most important tool for me for a Swiss Army knife to have for outdoors consideration is that saw right there. On the back, you've got an awl and a corkscrew. You can get the hiker if you want to change this corkscrew to a Phillips head screwdriver, depending on what you think he will find more useful. Always remember that that corkscrew can be used both to attach or uh, house additional implements, such as the small eyeglass screwdriver, as well as their fire starter uh, accessories. They'll fit inside there too. It can also help untie knots, which I find useful in an outdoors Swiss Army knife, but the uh, standard Phillips head may be more useful to you. Check that out. For a few bucks more, you could get the Huntsman. It adds, uh, it adds the hook on the back and a pair of scissors. It's like 50 bucks though, so technically above your limit. I hope those help. And uh, I hope the old man finds them useful. All right, next question comes from Diego Gutierrez. Gutierrez, sorry. Kind of butchered that there a little bit. Uh, hi, DCA. So I was considering the Bastinelli Pika and the Spyderco Street Beat as an EDC tactical fixed blade. Out of these two, which would you choose? And if you have other suggestions, it'd be appreciated. Top of my price range is about how much the Pika costs, so about 150. Thanks and enjoy the holidays. Just came in a couple weeks ago, the question itself. So I hope you did enjoy your holidays. Mine turned out pretty good. Now between these two knives, I've actually got the $200 version of the Pika here uh, with the uh, wrapped handle. The unwrapped version is the 150 version. Um, depends on what you want or what you mean by tactical EDC. If its sole purpose is to be a tactical thing and it's only going to be really used for tactical stuff, I would want to be in another line of work personally. <laughs> um, then whichever one you're more comfortably trained with, because when we're talking tactical use of a blade, you got to know what you're doing. You got to have some muscle memory, some actual training to truly effectively use any knife, but a karambit especially, I would say. If you want this to be a tactical use only in an emergency, but you want to be able to use the blade more kind of normally, so to speak, for EDC stuff, for me personally, I'd go with the more quote unquote normal blade, the clip point uh, flat ground blade on the street beat. It's got a good handle on this knife and it's got a great blade shape to boot. Uh, and price on it is cheaper than the Pika, 121.45 right now, uh, at this very moment anyway and easier to sharpen. You know, the hawkbill shape on a karambit is a little trickier to sharpen. On the best of days, this Pika is also chisel ground on the backside too, or it's chisel ground full stop. So that further complicates sharpening a little bit. And yeah, you can certainly do your everyday box opening, package opening, letter opening even with this sort of thing, but it's gonna be a little more natural, I think, for you know, the Fred Perrin design blade on this Spyderco. 
I own one of these actually, so I, I know how well it works personally. Some other stuff that's similar to this, you might wanna check out the White River Backpacker. Uh, you can get models uh, of that with G10 scales for about 150, uh, wrapped handles for even less. But if you're looking for something, or, or I do have another thing for you to potentially consider, kind of bridging the gap between the more, for lack of a better word, conventional blade shape of the Spyderco, but the slightly more karambit -y, well, this is a, a true karambit, and the more karambit -y leanings of the Pika, how about the Topps Devil's Elbow XL? Uh, they actually make a few kind of karambit utility crossovers I like, like the Cut 4.0, that's a really good one, but it's bigger, um, significantly bigger feeling than any of these. But this, this one right here is pretty interesting. 117 carbon steel blade, but it is coated to help with the, uh, the potential worry of corrosion right there. Double edged, as you can see here too, about just over two inches on the uh, primary sharpened bevel right there. Got a linen micarta handle. You don't have a ring at the back, but it can very easily be held in a traditional karambit grip with the reverse style right there. Or it has a little bit of that kind of K-bar TDI DNA in it, and that held with the blade near your thumb, it has that kind of you know point and punch thing going on, which again, training, super important for this sort of thing, but this is kind of a muscle memory thing that can help a little bit. I don't wanna, I hesitate to, to give that as actual advice because I personally don't have that tactical training I'm, I'm here recommending, but use that, uh, use that with a heavy caveat, shall we say. But it's a tops. The quality is bomb proof. It's made in the US, the warranty on them is fantastic. This thing feels super stout. And even though it's double edged, which is a little trickier to use than a single edged blade for general utility stuff. I would find this particular blade a lot more intuitive to use than a hawkbill blade for your everyday utility stuff. It pinches really nicely. As you can see, I've got a pinch grip behind the blade right there, or right in front of the handle right there, using for opening boxes, that sort of thing. It feels pretty good. Pushing forward, doesn't work too bad either. And you got a nice solid hold onto it thanks to that micarta grip right there. The sheath comes with a whistle. You probably won't carry, keep that whistle on there, but simple kydex, the clip with the uh, kind of J, J style retention thing there at the bottom is rotatable. So you can put it at whatever angle you want to carry at, whether this is inside the waistband or clipped to a belt. Check it out too. Like I said, all of these knives are built exceptionally well, but if you're wanting a, an easier to use daily knife, I would personally shy away from a, a hawkbill blade. But if you want to, go for it, quite honestly, because uh, it can certainly work. All right, now we come to our lightning round for today. Justin Cox in Utah. How many vids can be made about the Buck 110 and 112? Well, this is episode number 110, so clearly at least one more. Uh, it is the best and always will be. The Gerber Gator ain't bad, but it's just a buck copy. Hard to improve upon perfection. I have no real answer to your video or to your uh, question, uh, but it is episode 110, so I thought I'd talk about the 110 a little bit more. Uh, I will say we did a Beat the Icon video on the Buck 110. I think it was really cool. Um, and really showed the influence of the 110 through the years, even on knives that don't even look too much like the Buck 110 anymore. Check that out, we'll have a link up this way right here. I, that was one of the videos that I'm really proud of actually. So check it out. Uh, next question comes from Rafael Garcia. I just purchased my first Buck 110 and I'm crazy excited for it. Thanks, Raphael. But I'm not a huge fan of belt carrying knives, so I wanted to know if you guys offer or know of a good in-pocket slip sheath for it. Please let me know. Sure thing. Check out this Chris Reeve large Sabenza pouch. It's calfskin leather, it's about 35 bucks, and this should do the trick. It's just two simple layers of leather right there. The edges are finished really nicely. Actually, just look how nicely they're tucked in on each other right there. And it is thick enough, or it does have enough room for a full thickness 110, but just to give you an idea of the length on how it'll fit, here it is with my 110 Slim Select right there. That should do you quite nicely, I think. 
All right, next up, Josh Kalkin says, Hey, DCA and crew, I'm a little under a year into the knife hobby and I've picked up several slicey, shall we say, svelte EDC knives. And I'm looking to dip my toes into the chunky overbuilt knife waters. But since I'm not sure if I'd like them, is there something you'd recommend that doesn't carry a premium price tag? I'd like to try to get the hefty folding knife experience without paying an arm and a leg, at least for the first one I buy. Sure thing, check out the Cold Steel SR1 Lite. $56, you got a four inch blade, 3 sixteenths of an inch thick on the blade stock. This is kind of like the cheapest, chunkiest experience you can get your hands on right now. And it still comes with their triad lock. So it's not just built down to a price, I would say. You've got solid, solid build quality, that tank-like aspect that you want from a big, chunky folder. You're not gonna break the bank while you're at it. Check that out. And last but not least, we come to our most serious question of the day, which comes from Bradley Marger. What's the best knife for shredding a wicked guitar solo? My good sir, that would be the Civivi Shredder, of course. And since shredding is all about flashiness, go with the Damascus version right here, about 78 bucks too. It's a, a cheap shreddy experience. And it's a Civivi, so it's built great. There you go. I would have said a buck 110. Would you now? Yeah. Seemed appropriate for the theme today. Yeah, I, I, I fail to see the connection to the, the shreddiness, however. That's okay. All right. It's episode 110. If anyone in the, uh, the comments can decode Thomas's logic on this one, I would appreciate it. This is going to be great because you have no logic behind what just happened, I'm sure. So we're going to come up with some, some cool explanations. Well, that's all I have for today. Next week is SHOT Show in Las Vegas. So we are gonna be out there, Thomas and I and uh, our good buddy Seth will be covering the show. We're gonna have lots of videos over the course of the next week. Uh, unfortunately, that is going to preempt our normal programming schedule. So no new Knives of the Week next week, no FAQ next weekend. But after the SHOT Show content is, uh, is run through, we'll be back to our regular schedule. SHOT Show is always a blast. There's gonna be some really cool stuff showing up. Let me know what you thought of my answers down in the comments section. If you have your own suggestions for any of these folks today, drop them down there as well. And as always, if you want a chance to have your question featured, same thing, comments section is where to put them. To get your hands on any of these knives, check out the links in the description. Those will take you to knifecenter.com. And as always, don't forget about our Knife Rewards program because when you're buying one of these knives today, it's real nice to be earning some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. See you next time.